The following audio is via a Skype call. I think what you should do is find the person responsible for this mess and see that they're punished. TGIF, everybody. I'm Gary Mance. I'm Suzanne Mitchell. Welcome to Mance and Mitchell, where metaphysically, emotionally, spiritually, entertainingly, we hope to be in your ear for the following hour, bringing you the best radio we can provide. And with that, of course, we have to say hello and a big thank you in advance for all of his audio wizardry. I'm talking, of course, on Fridays. That would be bad boy Benny Mathers at the board. How you doing, Benny? Uh, doing well. Good day, you too. And congratulations up to this point. Why, thank you so much. We appreciate well, it. Yeah, we appreciate welcome. it. Uh, but for what? Oh, there oh, could I be a know, number the of Tampa things. Bay Lightning. There oh, you go. The That's right. Oh, yes. Ooh. Hockey fans are we. Uh, <laughs> of course, there is the Chicago connection, Suzanne being a Chicago girl. So we have the Blackhawks affinity. But hey, when Tampa Bay, on those rare occasions, goes this far yeah. in the playoffs, we get all a Twitter. We're just excited as can be. Yeah, I, I kind of got revived after moving from Alaska. I was a big hockey fan. And then, of course, meeting you two. And I'm like, oh, it's just back in the blood it, like it never left. And there was <laughs> yeah. a, a pretty fantastic play, although it did not count on the or the triple play uh, overtime game, I should say triple overtime game, uh, where the head-butted goal was yeah. in called was by back. Chicago. Yes, right. it was by Chicago, which I I oh. saw the real time play of it. I'm like, oh, that's good. But they slowed it down, <laughs> and I'm like, ooh, yeah. He kind of intentionally shoved his head and pushed yeah, the. He did yeah. definitely, in my opinion, that yeah, should so. be legal to do that. <laughs> you it's, think so? yeah, I don't. I don't. All you have to do is change the rules. They change hockey rules all the time. All the time, right? Yeah. There. So I mean, to me, I thought that was brilliant. You know, it just didn't happen to go in accordance with the rules. What are you going to do? Right. Not so, a lie. It would have been great if like like hit his nose or like jumped out. Like if he <laughs> yeah. had a, a busted nose or a crooked nose, and then he hit it with his nose and it corrected it, and then made the goal. That would have been a totally like game yeah. of game. That, that's a press conference afterwards. So oh, man. You went from your nose into the net. How did that feel? Yeah, right. Well, you know, it was a good, good effort, eh? <laughs> Great effort, eh? Great effort. The band-aid will be yeah. ready for the next game. I went out there and just did what my coach told me to do. <laughs> that kind of player <laughs> yeah. works hard and he loves the game. That's that's the old standard in hockey. He works hard and he loves the game. <laughs> But well, we work hard at this game, and we do love it. We love being in in here in our home studio in Sarasota, Florida, but broadcasting from beautiful Puget Sound. And we're just about to bring our guest on air. But I would note, Benny, and if I've got this wrong, correct me. I have people on Facebook writing that you folks this week have been experiencing Florida weather. Uh, yes, uh, but then again, we're ramping up. I mean, we've had a mild winter and spring already, but we love it. Although for this Memorial Day weekend, unfortunately, we're returning back to the kind of cooler days. Uh, however, it's still pretty nice around here. Well, good for you. Good. Cherish the cool when it's there. It'll be yes. cool again for us about yeah. eh, mid-October. Yeah. So that's the way it goes yeah. weather-wise. There is a gentleman named Garnet Schulhauser who is going to be a first-time guest of ours today. We are very much looking forward to talking to him. And I have to say, Suzanne, that I give the man credit for taking initiative. As you know, we have publicists just nibbling on our ears constantly because they're pushing their clients. It's what they're supposed to do. And we have a network of friends and very established guests that we bring on anyway. So for somebody to crack the charm circle on their own initiative always impresses me. And this gentleman who has written a couple of books, the latest being Dancing Forever with Spirit, Astonishing Insights from Heaven, is right in our wheelhouse, as you know. It is. Let me tell you a little bit about our guest. Garnet Schulhauser is a retired lawyer who lives near Victoria on Vancouver Island with his wife, Kathy, and his little dog, Abby. He grew up on a small farm in Saskatchewan and moved to Calgary, Canada after law school, where he practiced corporate law for over 30 years with two blue-chip law firms. After retiring from his law firm in 2008, he began his new career as an author, and his first book, Dancing on a Stamp, was published in 2012. Since the release of his first book, Garnet has been active with book signing tours and speaking engagements, and has been a frequent guest on radio talk shows. We are here to welcome him for the first time to Manson Mitchell. Welcome, Garnet Schulhauser. How are you today? Very well. Thank you, Suzanne. How are you? 
I'm good. Are you a hockey fan? Vancouver didn't, is, is kind of out. So Well, you know, you know what? I, I lived for over 30 years in Calgary, so I'm still a Flames fan. Oh, yeah, go ah. Flames. And I still, I still recall the, the Stanley Cup final in 2004 when the Flames lost in seven games to Tampa Bay. Oh, so sorry for the sore memory. Yeah, he just had to bring it up. <laughs> had to bring it up. Rubbing, rubbing that, salt I'm sure that made you guys smile, but it didn't make me smile very much. <laughs> Yes, um, that did happen. We weren't even living in Tampa Bay at the time, but it was remarkable because the Tampa Bay Lightning were doormats perennially. Then all of a sudden, what do we have here? A Stanley Cup. What I will say before we depart from hockey and enter the world of spirit, are they not synonymous? But anyway, what I will tell you, Garnet, is that Calgary was very impressive for being a young, fast team with a good game plan. They got outgunned ultimately, but they certainly justified their spot in the Stanley Cup playoffs. Calgary should be very proud. Yeah, and we're very happy with them, and, and we think they're on their way up, so watch us next year. Uh, we will, we absolutely. Will. They have earned that distinction. Well, Garnet, thank you so much again for uh, being willing to reach out to us, because we hear from a lot of people who have their own stories of spirit communication. We have as a category of friends, I have to tell you, we have so many mediums as friends now, it goes beyond anything I could have imagined. I started out this show wanting to talk much of the time about UFOs, quite frankly. And then as soon as I decided, Suzanne, I think that's the direction we need to go. It was a talk that we had, and we were at the radio station, and we spoke to the station manager and said, yep, aliens, it's the way to go. What happened? Immediately, I met medium after medium after medium after medium, and it became Spiritualism 101, and I had to stop and say, maybe I'm supposed to go another way. And in your life, as a matter of fact, analogously, you had things going one way. You're a very reputable attorney with top-tier law firms, and you thought your life was going one way, and then something happened. Why don't we start right there at a pivotal moment in your life when everything changed forever? Well, it was back in 2007 in May, and I was still practicing law in Calgary, and I decided to go for a stroll one Sunday afternoon. It was a Monday afternoon, actually. So I was strolling down the street with my head sort of in the clouds thinking about all the problems I had to solve back at the office, and all of a sudden, out of nowhere, this homeless man jumps out in front of me, like, like, literally right in front of me. He was His face was like... Uh, two feet away from my face. Now, he, he looked like a typical homeless man with, you know, greasy, stringy hair and scraggly beard and dirty clothes. And my usual tactic when I encountered these people on that street was to do a quick sidestep and go around. But there's something about this guy that was very special, and it was his eyes. He had these amazing, sparkling, dazzling blue eyes that were penetrating deep into my soul. I felt like he knew everything about me, even though we'd never met before. And at the same time, his eyes were sending me this, this wave of pure, unconditional love that was infusing my whole body with a, an amazing sense of peace and security. It was a wonderful feeling, and I was, I was like a deer caught in the headlights. I just stood there, unable to move, in fact, unwilling to move, because I was enjoying my contact with this man so much. Um, it was like a time warp, I think, because I don't know how long I was standing there. And suddenly he broke the, he, he, he broke the reverie by saying to me, why are you here? And he quickly disappeared into a nearby store. So when I finally collected my wits, I decided to go after him and try to find him. So I went into that store. There was only one entrance and exit. He wasn't in the store anywhere. I hadn't seen him come out. I walked back on the street, walked up and down, couldn't see him anywhere. He had just disappeared into thin air. So that night, uh, I resolved, after thinking about the events, I, I knew I just had to find out who this guy was because he was just a very special person. So the very next afternoon, very same time, I went onto the same street and walked up and down trying to find him. And after about 15 or 20 minutes, when I was almost ready to give up, I spotted him sitting on a bench all by himself. So I walked up to him and I said, who are you and why did you stop me yesterday? And he said, I'm a soul just like you. I'm here to answer your questions and to help you on your journey. Well, my, my lawyer brain then kicked in, my skeptical lawyer brain. Uh, you know, when you've been practicing law for so long, you can't sort of get rid of your lawyer mind. And so I was skeptical, and I said to him, well, why do you think you could help me? Because you look like you've been sleeping on the street for weeks, and you can't even seem to help yourself, so how can you help me? And he just gave me a big smile, and he said, you know, looks can be deceiving, because you look like you're a very successful lawyer with everything under control. 
but we both know that's just the facade. He said, you can turn around, go back to your office, and see if you can find the answers to all your questions on all those emails waiting on your computer, or you can sit down and have a chat with me. So then, luckily, my intuition said, you know, I have nothing to lose other than maybe a half an hour of my time. I'd better sit down and find out who this guy is and to see if, uh, if he really can help me and answer my questions. So that was the beginning of our dialogue, which then went on for several months, and, was, and I described it in my first book, Dancing on a Stamp. Gary and I did not read your first book, Garnet, but um, I guess I did not understand from reading your second book that that the man that you met, you actually visited with many times in the flesh. Is yeah, that- well, actually, the first the first three times, Suzanne, he, uh, he appeared in the flesh, and I actually touched him. Um, he appeared as the homeless man the first three times. After that, he just communicated, communicated with me by telepathy, so it was just a voice in my head. And... Uh, uh, he, he, he later told me that he, I was the only person who could see him in the flesh. That nobody else would have been able to view him had they been walking by the street that day. And when I asked him why he appeared to me in that fashion, he said, well, I wanted to ease you into the conversation um, because if I had just started talking to you as a voice in your head, you likely would have thought you were going crazy. Um, so I had to sort of draw your attention in a very gentle manner and then once once you were comfortable in speaking to me, then we could carry on through telepathy, and I didn't have to appear anymore. So that made a lot of sense to me. And, and, and he also told me very early on that he was really one of my spirit guides in disguise. Um, and so he had, he had been my guide for most of my life, and uh, he had chosen this time to appear in the flesh and start the conversation. And the reason for doing that was he wanted to just not only answer my questions that I've been asking myself for the last 10 15, 20 years, but he wanted me to write a book about uh, our dialogue so others would have access to what he was about to reveal to me. And and so that's why I wrote my first book. Uh, And so the first book was really a dialogue between him and I where I asked questions and then he would answer it. I described that in my first book. My second book was very much of a different forum in in terms of our encounter, uh, and I can get into that if if you'd like me to do so right now. You know, Gary's question had to do with, um, you know, what changed your life and, and what what got you going in one direction. Uh, perhaps you were um, near the end of your lawyer career because you're retired now. Uh, so maybe this was just the next phase of your life. And obviously this encounter with this person was the trajectory that took you off the direction that you were going in. What you're saying about the person that you met who was in the flesh for maybe three visits and then after that in your head, now that's a really key point right there. I mean, you had to know that it was the same man. There had to be some evidence that the person that you were talking to three times in the flesh was now talking to you without being in the flesh and at, at that point, you know, two things. <clears throat> One is, <clears throat> how was that received? Did you discuss that with anybody? And, and more to the point is, <clears throat> what, what does occur to most people when they are now saying that they are in conversations with somebody from another dimension? And you tell a great story about that, um, about a woman named Judy who was uh, taken from her family. So it's kind of a two-part question. Well, to answer the first part, it it, it was very much of a life-changing event for me. At that stage of my life, I was, to be honest, was was tired of practicing law. And so I I was thinking about retiring. And then after I met Albert, it it really transformed my life, and and practicing law seemed to be very... uh, tedious and uh, irrelevant to me after that, and actually retired about one year later in 2008, and then I took on my new mission of uh, continuing my dialogue with Albert and to write my book. Now, it wasn't easy to to uh, to actually go ahead and, and, and publish my manuscript. When I was finished writing it, I had to make a decision. Did I want to come out of the spiritual closet and let my friends and former part law partners and colleagues and clients know that I had been speaking with my spirit guide, and I was concerned about them thinking that I'd lost my mind. Um, and so I had to, I struggled with that for a while, eventually decided I just had to do it, and I sought a publisher and had it published. Um, so it was a very 
transformation, uh, a life-transforming moment for me, um, and, and I'm glad I did it uh, because it was, uh, you know, I've had some, a lot of positive reaction. I have had some negative reaction, and, and a lot of my, some, some of my former partners, um, you know, have just shunned me and, and colleagues and clients, and I know that they are thinking, they haven't said it, but they're thinking that I've, you know, I've, I've gone off on a, a wild track here and that uh, they don't really want to talk to me about it. But others have supported me, so it's been, you know, you win some and you lose some. I expected that. Um, I didn't talk to anybody initially about my meeting with Albert, not even my wife, until about a year later because I was honestly concerned about what she might think. When I did broach the subject with my wife, she was very supportive, and I told my two sons they were very supportive, and gradually I sort of brought more people into the network, um, and it was, uh, it, it, for the most part, was a pretty positive reaction. I did lose some people along the way, but um, I expected that. You so I think that, that was your Garnet. first question. Uh, yes, go ahead. Uh, can, you, can you repeat your second question, Suzanne, please? Uh, well, it just had to do with, you know, not everybody makes the kind of transition that you made. For example, Judy did not make a very good transition. And who's Judy anyway? Well, well Judy was the, 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 the patient in the mental institution that, that uh, Albert took me to as part of our astral journeys. Um, and, and I described that in my second book, Dancing Forever with Spirit. And what happened there was that she had contact with people, spirits from beyond the veil, from a from an early age. And uh, um, when she eventually she got married and and uh, had children, and and uh, the, the the contact became more uh, more apparent to her and more frequent. And so she ended up telling her husband about it, who suggested after a while that perhaps she should see a psychiatrist. And uh, and uh, the, to make a long story short, she ended up in a mental hospital because. She was describing uh, the visions of uh, people, events, things from other dimensions that she could see, but nobody else could. And of course, they just labeled her as a schizophrenic um, and kept her sedated, and that's where she was. But in reality, she wasn't crazy. She just had a gift of being able to see into other dimensions, and uh, that's what she was. Uh, her whole life became sort of occupied with these visions and these uh, uh, contacts with other uh, beings in other dimensions. Um, so it was really a sort of a, he, he just wanted to demonstrate to me that in a lot of cases, people who are labeled as schizophrenic or crazy uh, are really seeing things that the rest of us just can't see. Garnet, let's go ahead and take our first break of the hour, right on time for that. I'm very curious to know about the means whereby, and particularly in your case, Garnet, where you had the opportunity, a rather extraordinary opportunity at that, to be guided by a an entity, a spirit, a soul named Albert. Oh, the places you'll go, right? So we would like to hear those stories, and we'll place particular emphasis on a few of them when we come back. This is amazing stuff, and I'm very glad that we have Garnet Schulhauser with us. His latest book is called Dancing Forever with Spirit, Astonishing Insights from Heaven, as though there would be any other kind when you're talking about heaven and all those dimensions. Stay with us. You're listening to Manson Mitchell right here on Seattle's home of alternative talk, AM 1150. I have known you all my life. Girl, it seems to me that you will always be very close to me. The preceding audio was via a Skype call. Staying connected with Gary Mance and Suzanne Mitchell is easy. Just go to manceandmitchell.com for the latest info on topics and guests. Sign up for early notice about future shows on a spam-free listserv. Friend Gary Mance and Suzanne Mitchell on their Facebook pages and like the Mance and Mitchell show page at facebook.com slash Mitchell. If you're on Twitter, share a follow with Gary and Suzanne at Mance Mitchell. Join Gary and Suzanne Friday and Saturday mornings at 10 a.m. for an unusual show that covers everything from personal growth to the paranormal. Here's an amazing act. Here's a tremendous act. Here's a startling act. The amazing, the thrilling, the greatest, spectacular, incredible, exciting, wonderful, world fame, most unusual novelty act. The home of the A-Team of Alternative Talk is ManceAndMitchell.com. Heard right here on Alternative Talk 1150 a.m. or streaming live from your computer anywhere. In 1964, a gallon of milk cost 49 cents. A gallon of gasoline was only 30 cents. And 97% of all children with leukemia died. Times certainly have changed. Today, thanks in part to research funded by the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society, the five-year survival rate for the most common childhood leukemia 
is more than 90%. We've also helped fund breakthrough treatments like targeted therapies and immunotherapy drugs. First approved by the FDA for blood cancers, these therapies are now showing promise for patients with other cancers as well. Funding more than 300 active research programs, the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society needs your support to help fund the next breakthrough, or perhaps even a cure. Go to LLS.org or call 888-HELP-LLS. Go to LLS.org and help save lives, not someday, but today. Hi, this is Susan Harmon, inviting you to join me for the Susan Harmon Hour every Friday at noon on Alternative Talk 1150. Expect surprises, fun, and information from a wide variety of guests sharing their views on up-to-date issues from a spiritual perspective. Again, that's the Susan Harmon Hour every Friday at noon on Alternative Talk 1150. Clear, clean, and crisp. Check us out in digital quality sound on FM 98.9 HD3. Alternative Talk 1150. The following audio is via a Skype call. We're so sorry if we caused you any pain. We're so sorry, Uncle Albert. But there's no one left at home, and I believe I'm correct. You knew that was coming. Uncle Albert Admiral Halsey, the fabulous Sir Paul McCartney. And the book we're talking about right now is Dancing Forever with Spirit, Astonishing Insights from Heaven, Heaven Brought Through to an Individual, a man who could be rightfully considered extremely left-brained and a very high-functioning individual at that, a career attorney. Garnet Schulhauser is the author of that book. He is our guest of this hour, and he has plenty of stories to tell. Garnet, I always like to say, let's begin at the beginning, and we come to the end, we'll stop there. And that's bound by the clock in our case here on the radio. Garnet, I would love it if you would tell our listeners how you came to appreciate the fullness of your soul's evolution as guided by Albert through what appears to be the revelation of a multifaceted life review, a tour of your lives as a soul. Why don't you tell us about that? Well, um, it, it, I, there were sort of two aspects to that, Gary. The first time um, it w- was uh, uh, Albert took me to the spirit side, and, and we went to the Akashic Records, which, as you know, uh, contains the records of every life that's ever been lived anywhere in the universe. And uh, the first part of that was he took me for a brief review of a couple of segments of my current life. And, and, and this was just a preview of what happens when I physically lie, because we all, um, we all have a life review to look back on the lives we've just lived on Earth uh, for the purpose of sort of figuring out where we went off track, uh, where we made mistakes, where we did good. Uh, and so he gave me a brief preview of that, and, 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 and there was a lesson there for it, uh, for me and for everyone in it. Um, and he showed me a, a couple of segments, one of which was uh, I was in, a, in the seventh grade, and I was uh, 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 sitting in, a, in the classroom, and uh, the recess bell rang, and we went running out with all the other guys to, to, on the, to the playground to, for a pickup game of soccer, and one of my good friends, who was fairly chubby, was lagging behind, and I said to him, you know, hurry up, fatso, we don't have all day. Um, and, and then uh, it, part of the, the, the benefits of the life review is that you get to, to, to not only watch what you did and said, but you actually get to feel the emotions and hear the thoughts of the people you interacted with. And so after I said that, my poor friend Adam was just devastated. He, uh, he, he felt horrible about it. Uh, he couldn't understand why I was making fun of him in front of everyone else. And he just wanted to drop into a hole and disappear. Uh, so that was an amazing. I, I do I do recall the event, but I didn't obviously didn't know how devastating my joking words were to uh, to to Adam. And I had no intention of hurting him, but there it was. Um, and uh, the, the other part of that was that he actually showed me that animals have feelings and 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 they and emotions as well. And in the, the next segment, he showed me a, 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 a situation where I was still practicing law. I came home from work. My little dog, Oscar, a little mini schnauzer, uh, came running to the door as I came in, hoping to be greeted, and I just totally ignored him because I was head of spilled the stuff from uh, at work. Um, and then I got to feel his emotions and thoughts where the poor little dog was just, again, devastated because I totally ignored him. And, and it really brings home the fact that before we think and act or 
do things, we have to really consider how our words and our actions uh, affect others around us, because oftentimes, uh, even though we don't intend it, we could really, uh, uh, you know, cause some, some harm to other people, uh, make them feel badly, even though we don't intend to do it. So it's, it was very much of a, of, a, of a learning lesson. And that was just a brief preview. Um, then he also took me on another occasion to back to the Akashic Records where I got to uh, review segments of some of my previous lives on Earth, and that was very interesting. Um, and there was a bit of a lesson in it for me and for others in, in, in every one of those, um, and, and that was just sort of, again, uh, a small portion of the lives I've lived on Earth. Uh, and and uh, someday when I cross back over there, I can go there and, and view all of these. And, again, uh, when you're looking at your past lives on Earth, you, you can also get to... Um, uh, hear the, you know, the the thoughts and feel the emotions of the people you interact with, and it's really a, an amazing learning tool. You know, we um, we we know when we talk about the amnesia that everybody has when they come into this life, because this is the life that you need to be concerned about, not not your past lives. And it's interesting because there are ideas that you can get from past lives as to why things are the way they are in this life but you don't really get the complete picture you just get little snippets didn't albert just show you like a little piece here and a little piece there you don't really see the big picture you don't see the whole soul all of the lives all of the everything when you're doing when you're going to the records yeah and and albert very deliberately just showed me snippets of some of my past lives um he, he didn't let me sort of uh uh, uh, lollygag and, and, and choose the lives I wanted to see. I could have just spent forever, you know, as, as you could well imagine, going back through all my lives. But he had a very uh, strict agenda for me, and so he just showed me little snippets of it. But when I do cross over, like everyone else, uh, when I finish my life, this life on Earth, uh, we can, in fact, uh, reacquaint ourselves in intimate detail with every life we've lived to the extent that we want to. So um, I'm looking forward to going back to seeing more of my lives um, and, and, and getting uh, learning more from the fullness of, uh, of all that disclosure. But Albert just showed me some snippets, which I disclosed in my book, which were very helpful, but it just gives everyone an idea about what uh, you can see when you uh, actually go to the Akashic Records with no other timetable but, but your own curiosity. You know, one of the most interesting things that I read in your book, Garnet, uh, at Dancing Forever with Spirit, is the idea that we do have a life plan. We come in, we make a plan, and we come into this physical existence. But the thing that you said that I have not heard before is that we can, our souls can actually change our life plan while we're here. And you say that the, the, when we do that is in nightly trips to the other side. Can you say a little yeah. bit about that? Yeah, exactly. Well, of course, as you said, we, before we're born, we all prepare life plans to include the, sort of the major circumstances of our lives, like where we're going to be born, the, the identity of our parents and siblings and friends and so on. And, and, and we do that for the purpose of trying to learn and experience things that we need for our evolution. Um, but uh, because we have free will uh, once we uh, arrive on Earth and because we don't remember what's in our life plans, uh, we often you know, can go off course. Um, and and it, it, what Albert tells me is that every one of us, um, when we sleep at night, our souls leave our physical bodies and uh, take an astral trip uh, you know, to other places on Earth or m- most typically to the spirit side where we can consult with our spirit guides, uh, sort of a, an assessment of, uh, okay, so how, how's my life going so far? Uh, what else do I need to learn? How should I change things? Um, and after that consultation, we can actually modify our life plans. We can change it. We, we can change uh, sort of where we want to go. We can change the exit point that we had uh, planned for our departure. Uh, and so we can, we can do that as we go along based upon what we've experienced so far. So the, the, the big challenge, of course, and the big uh, problem with that is that none of us remember those astral trips every night, but we do it every night uh, and, uh, you know, without fail. Um, and uh, we're not allowed to remember uh, those trips, uh, except in very rare circumstances. But, yeah, that actually does happen. Uh, it's sort of a, it's a bit of a moving target. It's not etched in stone, um, and uh, you can change it as often as you like. It's interesting to me, Garnet, this, this idea of forgetting, which seems to be strategic to our soul's plan for evolution. It's not only that we don't remember what we do while we 
are dreaming and our body is laying in bed. That's one aspect of it. But the much greater one, it seems to me, is that we don't remember from lifetime to lifetime. And so I'm curious to know, from your perspective and with all that you've experienced, how do we make sense of our souls as souls if we can't access what we were supposed to learn and didn't perhaps the last time or two lifetimes ago. It seems to me that would come in pretty handy. Yeah, it would. But, but in fact, if we remembered all of our past lives and if we remembered where we came from and what we put in our life plan, it would be too easy. It would be like, as Albert said, it would be like the, the, your teacher giving you the questions and answers to a final exam before the exam. What's the purpose in writing it? So, first, a very challenging school. And part of the big challenge is that we aren't allowed to remember who we are, where we came from, or what we're trying to plan, or what we're trying to experience. And so that's a very big challenge. And, and, and uh, Earth is one of the, according to Albert, one of the toughest schools in the universe. I mean, there's a lot of easier places to incarnate than this planet. It's no walk in the park, as you know, um, and, and it's, uh, it's designed uh, to be very challenging. And so you know, souls who come to Earth, according to Albert, and, and to incarnate as humans, are very uh, courageous souls because it's a tough place to be. So he often said every human should pat themselves on the back for being uh, courageous enough to come in and incarnate on this planet. But to, to, to carry on with your question, um, we do regain all of our knowledge about our, our, you know, our previous lives. Once we cross over from this life, uh, we'll remember our previous lives and the wisdom and experiences we had in all of our previous lives. We're just not allowed to remember that while we're here as humans on Earth. And that's just to make it it's to make it tough for us and to make our uh, uh, our lives here, uh, um, you know, a lot more challenging uh, and, and so that we can uh, really have to struggle more to overcome uh, the obstacles that we've placed in front of us uh, and, and to get through this life with as few mistakes um, as possible uh, so that we can evolve. It's just part of our, part of our evolution. And if we choose not to, to take the big challenge of coming to Earth, uh, well, we can go elsewhere or stay in the spirit side. So... Uh, we're here for a very specific purpose. And uh, with our free will included, apparently, we get to choose. Yeah, yeah the free will is a big part of that. And it's not only our free will, but the free, the free will of everyone else on this planet that we interact with. And so we, we can't, when you're on the spirit side, you can't predict exactly what's going to happen, even though you devise the life plan, because, because once you're there, you forget uh, what's in your life plan. You have free will. Other people have free will. And sort of it's a, it, it's a bit of a, a, a huge interaction of free wills operating on this planet uh, from people who have written scripts that they don't remember uh, what is in them. And so it's, uh, you know, you, you, Albert says we very frequently go off course. Um, we, we get guidance from our spirit guides to, to try to get back on course. And that guidance is, is very subtle. For the most part, it's like uh, intuitive flashes of thought. Uh, gut feelings, uh, coincidental events, whispers in our minds. Uh, our guides are constantly coaching us, trying to get us back on the path we had planned for ourselves, but it, it's very hard for us to hear those messages, and most of the time they're lost in the clutter of all the other thoughts that run through our minds every day. So it, it's, it's very challenging, um, And uh, but the good news is no matter what happens, no matter how far off course we go, uh, we can never go wrong or become lost because we'll always end up back on the spirit side where we can review our life, regroup, and then plan the next adventure. You know, Garnet, I, I detected a distinction that you made in the book, and I don't know if it was intentional or unintentional, but I'll tell you the distinction that I read. You talk about the life plan, you talk about the life review, and about the opportunity to uh, for your soul's evolution to change nightly by discussing it with your spirit guides when you're um, supposedly sleeping, you might be just awake all the time. But um, the other thing that you talk about is life purpose. And the distinction that I read in there is that the life plan is something that you plan before you incarnate. But what I like what you said about your life purpose, because you because people walk around saying, oh, if I only knew what my purpose was, I would do it. I hear this all the time. Just tell me what I'm supposed to be doing and I'll do it and I'll be happy. But one of the things you say is that with life purpose, as opposed to life plan, it changes by age. And when you're in grammar school, your life purpose may be to learn. 
you you may wake up every day, you're going to school, you're a youngster, and your purpose is to learn as much as you can and become as best educated as you can. And then later on, your life purpose may not have to do with education anymore because at a different age, your life purpose may have to do with experiencing and expressing the best career that you can at that point. How can I have a family, get a home, make money, enjoy what I'm doing as far as a career goes. And then at some point, like you retired from being a lawyer, then that's no longer your life purpose. So now at a different age, now you have another life purpose that isn't related to going to school or meeting a mate or having a career. Now it's something else. So I don't know if you intended that, but it was something that I read in your book. Do, do you see that distinction between your life plan and your life purpose? Yes, and, and I think it was, uh, it, yeah, one of the things that really caught my attention when, when I was, uh, you know, I, I obviously during our conversation I'd ask Albert, you know, well, how do you find the, the typical question, how do you find, uh, how do I find my life's purpose? And, he's, and he very carefully explained to me that, it, yeah, it does in fact change depending on the stage of your life. And you said it out very nicely, Suzanne, is that, uh, you know, as you go through stages of life, your purpose uh, does change. And part of the thing that we, that the, 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 the challenge that we have is to try to find out what our purpose is at any given stage. Now, when you're uh, six years old, of course, you don't think about life purpose. You just sort of go through school and, and learning. But when you get older, um, then you start to think about, okay, what am I supposed to be doing? What should I accomplish? You know, what's my purpose in life? And, and, and when you hit that stage, that's when you really have to carefully um, uh, listen to what your guides are saying uh, and, uh, and, 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 and try to learn what, 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 what feels right in your heart in terms of where you should be going, what you should be doing, uh, you know, what, you, what you should be trying to accomplish. So once you get to that stage of actually asking for that, uh, then, then it, the, uh, the, the challenge is to try to find out what it is at that particular stage, recognizing that uh, it will change. It will change as you, as, as you age, and uh, so, so you have to try to find your purpose at any given stage. And when you do find your purpose, as I think Albert said, uh, it will feel right to you. You will feel good about it. Um, it, it. On the other hand, if you feel off balance, um, if you feel like you're banging your head against a brick wall, then perhaps you really need to examine what you're doing and and change course and find uh, what your true purpose is at that stage and then move forward. So there is a distinction. It's a subtle distinction, but but it's certainly there. I like that you said it needs to feel right because I, I heard a minister say one time in a talk don't think that your life purpose is something that you don't want to do like oh my gosh I should go to some third world country and help them and I don't want to do that you know if that's not what your soul is calling you to do then that's not really your life purpose if it feels right what you are doing at that time then you know that you're on the right tra track for your soul's evolution your life purpose doesn't have to be something that you think, oh my gosh, I don't want to do that. That's not your life purpose. Your life purpose no, it, is something that feels good. Exactly, Suzanne. And and if you if, if you if you're feeling good about what you're doing, I think then you can feel sure that you're on the right track. And, and if and and you shouldn't try to talk, as you say, talk yourself into doing something that you think might be good, um, but you just don't really want to do it because if you try it, you're going to be unhappy and you're really going to be off track. So I think you have to sort of follow your heart, follow your intuition, because that is. Those are messages coming from your your higher self and from your guides, and that's where you should really head. And, and so you you put it you said it perfectly, Suzanne. Let's go ahead and take our second break of this hour. We are talking with Garnet Schulhauser, author of Dancing on a Stamp and Dancing Forever with Spirit. More when we come back on Manson Mitchell. Stay tuned. You're listening to Alternative Talk AM 1150. The preceding audio was via a Skype call. Are you looking for an affordable and effective way to market your holistic business? By advertising in Seattle Natural Awakenings magazine in print and online, you will reach a readership of 50,000 ideal customers. And like no other magazine, we also have creative tools to deliver your message to the world. Join the Seattle Natural Awakenings family and let us support you in bringing your business to the next level. To get into our next issue, call 425 350 
888-345-4448 or visit us online at seattleawakenings.com. We are ready to go to work with you and for you. Make plans to meet paranormal researcher Rosemary Ellen Guiley in person when she comes to Washington this summer. July 2 through 5, Rosemary will speak at the annual ESETI conference in Trout Lake, Washington. Her workshop, Living on an Interdimensional Earth, will be given at James Gilliland's legendary skywatching ranch at the foot of Mount Adams. The following weekend, catch Rosemary in Seattle, July 10 and 11 at East West Bookshop for a Friday evening event and all-day Saturday workshop on developing psychic skills and building psychic protection. Take it from Rosemary. When you're dealing with everything from ghosts to extraterrestrials, You need tools to keep yourself safe when working with the non-physical. Rosemary then makes her way to Everett on July 17 and 18 for a Friday evening lecture on the changing relationship between humans and angels and a Saturday workshop on establishing and deepening your contact with the angelic realm. All this will happen at Vision Quest in Everett. Mark your calendar for some great opportunities to work with a very high caliber and a nationally famous paranormal researcher this summer. With more than 60 books published on a wide range of paranormal, spiritual, and mystical topics and over 30 years of experience in paranormal activity, this will be the only opportunity this year to see her in person in Washington. Rosemary Ellen Guiley in Trout Lake, Seattle, and Everett in July. For more information and to sign up for her newsletter, Go to VisionaryLiving.com. That's www.VisionaryLiving.com. On Friday, Manson Mitchell welcomed Garnet Schulhauser, who talks about his astonishing spiritual insights gained with the help of his guide. On Saturday, Karen Dahlman returns with wisdom from the mystery schools about the hidden teachings of the alchemists. Then stay tuned for DJs for a Day, bringing you musical selections perfect for the Memorial Day weekend. Bringing you fascinating talk since 2007, we are Manson Mitchell, Friday and Saturday mornings at 10 on Alternative Talk, AM 1150. Made fresh each day for you, Alternative Talk, 1150 AM. The following audio is via a Skype call. Welcome back, and what a timely bumper that is, that bumper music, as it's called in the trade. We're talking with Garnet Schulhauser, author of two books, Dancing on a Stamp is the first one, and lately, Dancing Forever with Spirit, Astonishing Insights from Heaven. Garnet joins us on the phone. Garnet, this is the point in the hour where we give you the opportunity to tell people, to tell our beloved listeners how they can get in touch with you online and participate in your various projects. Where do they go? Well, they go to my website, Gary, which is uh, garnetschulhelzer.com, or you can also get to there by, by dialing in dancingonastamp.com. And on my website, I have lots of information about both of my books. Uh, you can uh, uh, click on to uh, book videos for, for both books, um, my contact information is there. Buy links for all the books from with all the popular online stores are on my website. All you have to do is click, uh, and uh, and you're there, and you're able to buy, you know, either ebook or paperback versions. Um, and uh, my email contact address is on my website. It's contact at garnetschulzer.com. I'd love to hear from your listeners with comments or questions. Um, and uh, my my YouTube channel has uh, uh, recordings of all of my radio. Uh, shows in the past, uh, and, and including my uh, my talk in 2013 at the Ozark Mountain Transformation Conference. Um, I'm also going to be speaking again this year at the Ozark Mountain Transformation Conference in July 17th and 19th in, uh, in Springdale, Arkansas. Um, if you can't make that uh, conference, I will post the video of my, of my talk um, on my YouTube channel. So there's lots of information you can access from my website, and um, I'd love to have people... Uh, comment on my blog post which is also on my website um, so love to hear from everyone Garnet, i'm wowed that's so much stuff that was much more than i expected that's wonderful you're way out there in the social media and all the great sites that are available well thanks very much suzanne i, I wanted hard. you did, well you try hard i think you succeed too um one of the things that i wanted to talk to you about something that interests 
uh, both Gary and me, is this idea of um, being in conflict with your life plan and not really knowing what your life plan is and how that works with something like the law of attraction because, you know, for some people they, they understand and use that spiritual principle very well but I think other people kind of approach it like a gumball machine. If I, if I put my penny in, I'm going to get my gumball out. So you had a few things to say about law of attraction and about being in conflict with your life plan that I thought were pretty interesting. Can I, can I want a red Ferrari and get a red Ferrari? I mean, how does that work? Well, uh, first of all, uh, the thoughts are very powerful. Uh, Albert says that, that thoughts are just waves of energy that go out and span out of the universe and affect other energy and other matter. Um, and focused thoughts are more powerful than just scattered thoughts. But he says if, if people, uh, uh, if, if they wish for something like a red Ferrari, um, it, your thoughts are not always manifested on the earth plane because um, a lot of times what your mind wants, what your human desires are, are in conflict with what your higher self wants for you. Your higher self is looking at your life in accordance with the life plan it develops, and it wants you to sort of stay as close as possible on that plan. And if buying a red Ferrari is going to throw you way off of a course because you might drive too fast, be in a car accident, and end up uh, severely injuring yourself, if that's going to sort of drastically move you off your life plan, your, your soul is going to be wishing for the opposite. In other words, that you should not have a red Ferrari. And so that's why a lot of your thoughts are not manifested and that's why the law of attraction doesn't always work, because sometimes your soul is sending out conflicting thoughts, conflicting desires, and the two cancel out. So, um, you know, sometimes it works very, very well, and other times it doesn't. And you shouldn't get frustrated when it doesn't, because um, you should just uh, you think that maybe your soul wants something different for you, has different plans, and that w- whatever you're desiring is not something that, that suits the higher purpose for you. So that's why it doesn't always work, Suzanne. And at the same time, you, you also say that, you know, if, if it appears, if there is something in you, if there's something deep within you that says, this is what I really want, then you can put those thoughts into your head on a regular enough basis so that there, there comes a bit of an alignment between your soul and your thoughts. They don't have to be in conflict, but in order to get things to work out in the physical, you do have to somehow change your thinking so that you're no longer in conflict with your soul's plan. I don't know that's, if I said that right, but yeah, yeah, no, I totally understand. And and and, and you know what Albert basically said was that if you if you uh, uh, your human mind really desires something very strongly, if you keep on putting that thought out there, um, uh, eventually you may in fact convince your higher self that okay, um, we should really go this direction because otherwise it's going to uh, you know this person is going to be too frustrated with with their lives and 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 that may cause other problems. So sometimes you can actually bring your convert your soul to your way of thinking um, if you really feel strongly and passionately enough about it. So, so it, it's, not, it, it's not etched in stone forever. Uh, your soul may start off by saying, I don't think you should do that, but, but you convince your higher self that that's really, what you should, that that's really best for you and it, it, it won't cause the, the damage or the harm that your soul anticipates. Uh, and so, you know, there, there's room. It, it's like a bit of a negotiation. You can actually try to persuade your soul that your way of thinking is the is a good way and your soul can make adjustments in your life plan. So, um, uh, you know, you, you should always keep on trying. If you really, really want something, keep on putting that thought out there. Eventually, you may turn your soul uh, to your way of thinking. You know, Garnet, I think there are two ways you can approach it, seeming opposites, but I think both work equally well, and I've tried both, as a matter of fact. When you want to apply the law of attraction to a desired goal, I have found that cool objectivity or warm enthusiasm alike will attract to you what you desire. I've seen this again and again because in a state of cool objectivity, you can think clearly. In a state of warm enthusiasm, you have inspired notions. If you can blend them, you're a spiritual genius and already an ascended master. But the idea is, uh, in terms of one strategy, I think if you can keep your cool or if you can get excited about a positive idea, you're going to alter your life plan in ways that benefit not only you, but the planet. 
Yeah, absolutely. And I think and, and I think that that the, you know positive thinking for sure. Albert said it, it never give up. Always uh, you know if, if you really desire something, uh, keep thinking that way. Focus your thoughts. Uh, you know, keep on it day after day after day, and eventually uh, you know you can turn things around. So never never give up. Never never despair. That uh, you know your initial thought about wanting something doesn't happen. You have to sort of keep at it. Perseverance is the is the key. I wanted to ask you why I had the chance, Garnet. Did Albert have anything to say to you about the relative merits and deficiencies of the world's religions? They've always seemed man-made to me, no matter how much they claim revelation. Human beings create their religious beliefs and practices, and I'm wondering if Albert agreed. Oh, absolutely. I mean, we, we did have a discussion about that. I was raised as a Roman Catholic, and so I did ask him some questions about the, the teachings of the Christian Church, and he said, well, you know, Jesus, the soul who, who incarnated as Jesus Christ was a, was a very a, a, a advanced soul, a master, and he came to our planet to try to uh, help humanity. Um, and so he was the, the, the founder of the Christian Church, but, uh, and, and all the things that he said to the extent that they are, are, they are uh, uh, correctly uh, prescribed in the, uh, in the Gospels um, are, are valid teachings. But he said that, that men who follow Jesus, uh, who um, developed the rules and beliefs for the Christian Church, they were just men with their own agendas, and they set out rules and, and dogma and so on from, for the church that didn't really originate from Jesus Christ, and uh, but they had their own purpose. They wanted to control the masses through guilt and fear, and that's why a lot of the of the teachings and the rules of the Christian Church are what they are today. It's for a very specific purpose of controlling people. They didn't originate from Jesus Christ, and uh, uh, you know, uh, to the extent that they re- relay his. Uh, you know his honest teachings. That's fine, but they've gone off course in so many other ways. So he said, you know, uh, the Bible wasn't written by God, uh, wasn't written by Jesus. It was written by men. Uh, some of it is very true, and some of it was just edited and uh, and and modified to suit the the religious leaders' purpose, or their vision of the church. I'm perfectly prepared to believe that, <laughs> with with results following over the centuries as we've seen. And yet, people do have a spiritual side. You know, we we're often quoting the new adage, I won't say old adage, but the new adage, I'm spiritual but not religious. And so while people, um, a a certain segment, reject religion, organized religion, there is still this need to connect spiritually. Now you talk about how you were Roman Catholic. You don't say that you are practicing today and very faithful. So what is it that you do for your spirituality, Garnet? Well, what I do is I, is I try to uh, listen to my spirit guide, Albert, and try to learn from what he tells me. Uh, and, uh, and, and I've really signed on to this new paradigm uh, that he's uh, explained to me. Uh, a lot of it flies in the face of what I was taught as a child, uh, but that just makes good sense to me because I had rejected a lot of the dogma of the Catholic Church, uh, you know, in my 20s and 30s, and I was looking for something to fill the gap. Albert came along and he did fill it, and so now... Um, I, I, I'm spiritual in the sense that I recognize that uh, that the source is sort of all-encompassing in the universe, that you and I and everyone else, we're all individual aspects of the source, we're all connected, um, and that uh, we're here on a journey to grow and evolve, and, and when we're finished with our physical bodies, we'll die and cross back over to the spirit side. So to me, uh, sp- my spirituality is to recognize that we're all connected, we're all souls on the journey, um, and that um, and there basically there are no rules. The source doesn't make rules for us, and there's no judgment or punishment when we're finished. So that, to me, is uh, that that's sort of the, the end-all answer to uh, all the questions I've ever had um, and, and all the doubts I had about my uh, religious upbringing. We're under two minutes here, Garnet, so I know you'll have to be quick here, but I was relieved and a little perplexed at the same time in your book to to learn that there really aren't heroes and villains except in the relative sense when acts on earth are committed there's a moral play a morality play going on but from the higher planes of existence they don't see it that way is that not correct absolutely it, it, they regard life the souls and spirits that regard life on earth like a play so uh, you know it, it, there's good guys and there's bad guys when when those souls all cross over they're all good guys again. There are no bad guys. There's no carryover of, of any of the acts that happened on Earth other than the, the, the lessons that you've learned. And so if you're murdered on Earth, when uh, you and your uh, perpetrator cross back over, you don't feel any hatred or remorse uh, towards that person. You love each other unconditionally and recognize that you were all in a play on Earth 
running your own scripts, and sometimes you go off course, and that's just the way it is on Earth. So you, you might be good friends with somebody who you had an encounter with here that was very unpleasant. Or... Absolutely, yes, because, because we tend to travel in soul groups. And so, you know, through various lives, one time you're the, you're, you're the good guy, the next time you're the bad guy, and, but you are, in a sense, very much friends, and you've planned this all beforehand, uh, sometimes, sometimes not. But when you get back to the spirit side, you're all buddy-buddy again, and you recognize, well, okay, we went through this life on Earth, and, uh, and that's what happened, and we'll uh, jointly plan our next encounter together on Earth. So, yes, you're, you're, you're friends before you started, you're friends when you finish. Actors in the same troupe. Garnet Schulhauser, thank you so much for joining us today. I want to give the title of your book, your latest book, one more time, Dancing Forever with Spirit, Astonishing Insights from Heaven. Garnet, next time we have you on, let's talk about dancing on a stamp. That's great. Thank you, Gary and Suzanne. I, I love being on your show. Thank you for having me. Good. Stay tuned for Christine Upchurch, followed by Susan Harmon, and join us again tomorrow at 10 a.m. Have a good weekend. The preceding audio was via a Skype call.